Hi, I'm Pete Charman, a product manager with the Enterprise Manager team. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to use SnapClone to create a thin clone of a database, even when you're not using a cloud environment. Often, people think of cloning as only important as a cloud operation, but as I'll show you soon, that's not the only place that cloning can be important. It's ideal, for example, as a way to build environments for proofs of concept, test master creation, or indeed anywhere that you may need a one-off clone. With the clone and refresh functionality, you can clone from an existing snapshot of a database, or you can choose to clone to a particular point in time or SCN. Not only that, you can integrate both masking and patching for PSUs in this flow as well. Once you have created a clone, you can then refresh it from the source later with a few clicks. And finally, once you're done cloning through the user interface, you might then decide to clone and refresh in a scripted manner, using the EMCLI verbs that are provided for this. You can even schedule the cloning through EMCLI to occur at a time that suits you. Now let's look at the details of what can happen as part of this clone and refresh flow. On the left hand side you can see our production database. In the example I've got on the screen, this is an 11.204 database running in a three node rack environment with some RMAM backups already taken. So what can I do with this database when I clone it? Firstly I can mask sensitive data. Generally, when you take a copy of your production database to another environment, you want to mask some of the data in that database, such as credit card numbers, salary details, and so on. The admin flow allows you to apply a predefined masking format to your data as it is cloned, or indeed execute your own custom SQL scripts to change the data as you need to. Secondly, I can actually test patching as part of the flow. In the example I'm showing here, I'm cloning my 11.204 production database to an 11.204.2 test environment. Thirdly, I can change the configuration as part of the admin flow as well. Again, in the example I'm showing here, I'm moving from a three-node rack environment in production to a single instance test environment. Finally, if my underlying storage supports copy on write technology, I can also take advantage of that and take a snap or thin clone to my production environment where blocks are only written to my test environment as they are changed in production. That means I can build a lot more snap clones and still require only a very small percentage of the storage of my production environment. Now that you know all the capabilities we could use, let's walk through a demonstration of performing some of this flow. In this example, I'm just going to use snap clone to clone the database. To do that, let's log into Enterprise Manager Cloud Control 12C. I'm going to log into Enterprise Manager Cloud Control 12C as a standard user, that is, not as a super administrator. Firstly, I need to select the database to be cloned from the list of databases shown on the database's homepage. You can select any database that's running on supported storage. It doesn't have to be a standby database, but that would be recommended for continuous synchronization with production. In this case, I'm using one called Prod1STB. Now this particular database is a standby database that's running on a NetApp filer. I can see this by going to the storage registration page. If I click on the NetApp filer here, I can see the Prod1STB database is located on that NetApp filer and I can see all the files that are created for it. On the Prod1STB database homepage, I go through the provisioning menu to start the cloning process. Notice we have three options here for cloning. Because the Prod1 STB database resides on a NetApp filer, Enterprise Manager has recognized that I can take a snap clone of the database in addition to the full clone and clone DB options you can see as well. I'm going to start the wizard to create a snap clone database. On the source and destination step, I need to provide credentials for the source database and the host containing the Oracle home for that database. For the source data time series region, I can either choose now, which will take a snapshot of the source database and clone from it, or prior point in time. If I select prior point in time, a list of the existing snapshots for this database is shown, and I can choose any one of these to use as the basis for creating this clone. If 
The snapshots are listed in order of age with the oldest one on top and more recent ones behind it. For this example, I'll take this snapshot. Once I've selected the snapshot, I'm given the option to change the exact point in time or the SCN that I want to clone at. If I click in the time field itself, I'm shown the range of times I can specify. The lower bound here is the time snapshot was taken and the upper bound is the time when the next snapshot was taken. I'll change the time to something in between those two values. Now I need to give the destination database a name. I'm going to call this FinProd5. So I'll enter a global database name to match that. The SID is automatically determined for me from the global database name, although I could change that if I wanted to. Notice I can specify a single instance database, a rack database, or a rack one node database here, but in this case I'll just use single instance. Next I need to provide the Oracle home location and host name. Selecting the Oracle home will also select the matching host name. The Oracle Home I select here can be the same as the source database at a higher PSU or a different patch set. This allows me to test the updated version without impacting directly on the production environment. The final step on this page is to provide the relevant credentials. On the configuration wizard step, I need to provide a mount point prefix and the amount of writable space for the volumes that will be used by the clone. I'm going to use the database name to make that easier to identify which database is using this particular mount point and change the writable space. The listener is already selected for me, so I just need to provide the database credentials. and move on to the next step. Now I can specify initialization parameters for the database if I wish. I'm going to leave those at the defaults for now. If I have masking definitions defined to mask sensitive data, I can select which one should be applied after the database is cloned on the post-processing step. In this example I haven't defined a masking definition so I'm going to skip that. Notice that I can also select pre and post cloning scripts to be executed here, as well as a SQL script to customize the clone database. You could use this SQL script to provide a different masking definition that you've custom written, for example. I'm going to leave those blank and move on to the next step. On the schedule step, I can provide a different name for the instance of the deployment procedure if I want, schedule the procedure to run now, which is a default or later, and choose notification statuses that I can be informed about. I'm going to call the DP instance thin prod 5 so I can identify it and leave the rest as is and move on to the next step. Finally I can review all the inputs that have been provided to the deployment procedure. If I'm happy with all this I can submit it. The procedure activity page shows me the execution of the deployment procedure. I prefer to do an expand all and change the refresh time to every 30 seconds so I don't have to manually keep refreshing the page. The procedure takes a few minutes to complete so I've deleted that part of the video for you. You can see the step here in the output where we applied any PSUs that were available to be applied as part of the deployment procedure. Next I want to show you how you can refresh this database. So let's move to the clone and refresh dashboard.
Now you may have noticed when I first created this that I selected a time that was uh, some time back from where the production date currently is. So what this is showing me here is that this particular database has drifted by 15 days from the source database as a result of the time I actually selected. If I want to remedy that, I can simply click on the refresh button here. An enterprise manager will take me through the process of recreating this database. And here we are back on the same wizard we walked through before. In this case, I'm going to choose to refresh it to a, a more recent point in time, or a more recent snapshot, but use similar values for everything else to the last time we went through the wizard. Since there are no changes to the wizard, I'm not going to bother recording that since we've already been through it once. Once the refresh is done, I can go back to the database homepage and see the database has come back up again. I can now see the history of the database on the clone and refresh page. So as you can see, cloning can be used as a way to build environments for proofs of concept, test master creation, or indeed anywhere that you may need a one-off clone. We've seen that with the clone and refresh functionality, you can clone from an existing snapshot of a database, or you can choose to clone to a particular point in time, or SCN. Not only that, you can integrate both masking and patching for PSUs in this flow as well. Once you've created a clone, you can then refresh it from the source later with a few clicks. Also, while we haven't covered it in this screen watch, you can actually use the EMCLI verb, Refresh Database. This verb only takes a few inputs and makes refresh even simpler. It's ideal for DevOps or dev test type scenarios. I'm Pete Sharman. Thanks so much for watching.